they notice that the um, that this one's designed for someone who's four foot six? <laughs> Otherwise known as the perfectly sized human, right? Now wait, you're not live yet, so all these jokes you're making against me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to carry this around. All right, John, uh, you're ready whenever you want to come off of All right. I'm on? Yes. All right. We're good. Thank you, everyone, for having me. First of all, it's great to be here. Um, and good day to everyone who's watching online. And uh, I'm excited. This is my first time in the States. It's the very first time that I've been here, which is it's uh, ridiculous, really, because the vast majority of Truth To You listeners are from the States, right? Uh, the vast majority of people that attend the Tanakh tour are from the States. And uh, so I have Dave and Patty to thank for that. So I just wanted to say thank you for uh, making that possible. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And I want to say thanks to, um, uh, to Ross and Bridget for, for having me in, in their home. Uh, it's, it's really great. I mean, everything so far is brilliant. I'm still jet lagged, all right? <laughs> if I seem like I'm sort of, sort of glazing over, it's because really I'm in the back of my mind, I'm still asleep. But, but right now, Right now, in Australia, I'd be waking up, so I'm... Uh, good morning. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. The 79th Annual Conference, uh, and you may have noticed this year it's on a particular topic that I'm very excited about. Um, <laughs> that's enough to us. So before I go on with this particular topic, good day to Chad, right? So Chad's been to Israel with me seven times. Yeah, he's been on every single uh, Tanakh tour, and he drove all the way from Austin, Texas, to come and see me. So, you got a lot of Texas people here. Yeah. You might need to go to Texas. So I'm, I'm st just raise your hand if you've been on a Tanakh tour. What do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, um, and yeah, and also, Josh is coming on uh, the next uh, Tanakh tour. This year, Chad is joining us on the... Like, Dave's already spoken a bit about this, but we are going to, into Jordan for the first time. Uh, Jordan Biblical Tour. And, and you know, the, the subject matter that we've been dealing with of late has motivated us to do that because so much happened on that side of the Jordan River. Uh, that's where the whole mosaic narrative, almost all of the, of the mosaic narrative occurs. That's where <laughs> the Torah was written, really. I mean, the, the scroll of the Torah of Moses was... Penned. We want to go to Nebo and we want to look out over uh, the land and see the land as Moses saw it. Um, we're really looking forward to that. There's still room available. We hope that uh, you'll join us. Uh, if you go to tanaktours.com, tanaktours.com, you'll be able to get the details there. All right. So I want to begin by telling you a story. And it's a story about a discovery that was made in a cave. It was brought to light in the 1870s. And this discovery was presented to the academic community in the 1880s. With extraordinary claims to its antiquity, this claimed antiquity of the, of the discovery threatened both the accepted academic positions as well as, of the day, as well as the religious views. And as such, the discovery's claim to antiquity was ridiculed with one French savant saying that based on the supreme quality and exceptional state of the conservation of the discovery, it was clearly a forgery and its custodian a forger. He was accused of forging this particular discovery. The discovery, or the discoverer, his reputation tarnished by the, accus uh, the accusation of forgery, sadly died only a number of years later in the 1880s. Nevertheless, in the decades that followed, several other discoveries were made, also in caves, making way for the reconsideration of the authenticity. Can anyone guess what I'm talking about? The Dead Sea Scrolls were the, the successive, yeah, and what am I talking about? What's the topic that I'm talking about? What was the discovery? The Shapira Scroll. It makes sense that you would say that, that's, but it's, that's not what I'm talking about, all right? This is really weird. What I'm telling you about here uh, is another discovery altogether. 
Say again. The Jeremiah scroll? No. No. We could do this for a while, but I'll let you, I'll let you know. <laughs> so reconsider the academic steed, which eventually resulted in the retraction of claims of forgery, thus the Altamira paintings. Has anyone heard of the Altamira paintings in Spain? Okay. Were recognised as Upper Paleolithic artworks dating around 36,000 years old. That discoverer, and I'm going to get this name wrong, but his name is Don Marcelino Sanz de Sortuola. Is that good? All right. He was vindicated, but he had passed, as I mentioned, in the 1880s. Understandably, you thought that I was talking about the Moses Scroll because there are remarkable similarities. I mean, really remarkable similarities between the two stories. The story of Spain's Altamira cave paintings was brought to my attention by my father, who watched a, uh, a 2016 movie. It's a, a recent movie with Antonio Banderas called uh, Finding Altamira. Anyone seen it? It wasn't bad. I watched it. It was, it was a good film. It's worth looking up. Uh, particularly because, like I say, there's so many incredible similarities between these two stories. My father had read the Moses Scroll just recently when it came out. He loved the book. And, uh, and shortly after that, he watched this film, Finding Altamira, and he was so struck by these similarities that he rang me the next day and he said, you won't believe this. This is almost the same story. This happened to this guy as well. And um, it reminded me of a quote by Moses Shapira. And I think it is uh, highly relevant. He said, and, and it, wouldn't be, it just would not surprise me if Moses Shapira read about the Altamira Cave paintings in the paper. I mean, it was the news at the time. Um, I think it was discovered, yeah, it was discovered in, uh, in 79, a year after Moses Shapira acquired the Moses Scroll. Uh, an academic paper was published in 1980 and, uh, and it was certainly controversial. Moses Shapira said, the tendency of showing great scholarship by detecting a forgery is rather great in our time. And it makes me wonder if he was thinking about, or at least partially thinking about, the Altamira cave paintings. The reason why the paintings were so controversial to both the academic community and the religious community is that the academic community was enthousi enthusiastically embracing uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. And it seemed that such sophisticated artwork couldn't be that old as far as they were thinking about this particular theory in that day. There's no way that such primitive men, or whatever they thought we were back then, tens of thousands uh, of years ago, could possibly have created this artwork that was actually uh, paintings of bison on the ceiling of the cave. Um, intricate paintings of bison, even taking into consideration the uh, the formation of the cave ceiling to sort of bring it into a 3D um, uh, effect. And so it was laughed at. It threatened the, um, the theories of the day. And so, as I said, a French savant was quick to swoop in and declare it a forgery and Don Marcelino as the, the forger. The reason why it was controversial for the uh, religious community of the day, and we're talking about Catholicism in Spain primarily, is because it throws into question or it flies in the face of the genealogy of Genesis, right? Uh, we have an interesting genealogy in Genesis. We have some people that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Uh, it seems fantastic. And certainly the Altamira cave paintings um, told us without a doubt that the Earth is older than uh, 6,000 years old. So it was controversial. Uh, interestingly, the Moses Scroll finds no conflicts with the Altamira paintings. Whilst the Moses Scroll does affirm a six-day creation, it doesn't tell us when that happened, and it's not important. So it's important to point that out. So I was recently... Uh, as you well know, uh, many of you who know me, a, a Tanakh fundamentalist, okay? Uh, it says it in the book, and that's where I'd chosen to place my uh, agreed assumptions, right there in the Tanakh. This is true, this is inspired, this is inerrant. And one day, 
the conversation with Ross, uh, something happened that, that caused me to reconsider all that I held sacred. On that particular day, and I'm not blaming you, <laughs> on that particular day, <laughs> um, we happened to be discussing the eighth day of Sukkot. Who can tell me what happens on the eighth day of, of Sukkot? Can anyone remember? On that particular day, it is the day that the five books that are attributed to Moses are read in the synagogue from the beginning to the end, right? Uh, and Ross told me that you, I have a, uh, United Israel have a team that do exactly this exercise, right? And, uh, and that was interesting to me and we started talking about that and I said, hang on a second, how long does that take? Who can guess how long, have a guess, who, how long do you think it would take to go from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy? In Hebrew. In Hebrew. 15 hours. is a good guess. All right, so it's, a, it's higher than that. Anyone else? 70, it's lower. 20. It's actually 28, roundabouts, you know, depending on the speed that you, that you read. Uh, Ross tells me that at least the, the United Israel team, it takes about 28 hours of continual reading to complete. In Hebrew. In Hebrew. So it occurred to us that, hang on a minute, we have a timeline. We actually have a timeline for how long it takes to read what is described as the scroll of the Torah of Moses. And we find that timeline in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 3, for those that have their Bibles. It clearly states that Ezra read the scroll of the Torah of Moses on the first day of the seventh month. So we're, we're talking about close to the, the equinox. We're, we're talking about a six-hour uh, period of time maximum. That he read it from morning until midday. Yeah, morning till midday. So six, less than six hours. Because I say less than six hours, it could, set, it could be substantially less than six hours because it also says that it had enough time for the Levites to offer commentary and understanding to the scroll. So in other words, it took much less than six hours to read, certainly a fraction of the time it would take to read all five books. So that left us to think, <laughs> what did they read? Right? It gave me permission to think outside the box and to accept that what was what, at least what uh, Ezra read was not from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy. It just wasn't possible by any stretch of the imagination. So I considered it, I pondered it, and in the months that, that followed, I asked a couple of rabbi friends uh, what their opinion on the matter was. One said that he thought that um, the scroll of the Torah, Torah of Moses was likely embedded within Deuteronomy. Uh, you might expect someone to say that because, of course, Deuteronomy is the only one that is in the first person of Moses. That would make sense for the most part. Um, the other answered and said, uh, well, Ezra read the Torah. But when I pressed the time constraint that was there, he said, well, you know, I mean, he would, he would have read the Ten Commandments and uh, the blessings and the curses. And, uh, you know, that seems like a fair... A fair um, estimation, considering that those three ingredients would have been first priority at the very least, right? So, Ross was already way ahead of me. Ross at the time was trying to distill from the text what Moses actually wrote by looking at what, it, what the text actually says Moses wrote, because it doesn't say that he wrote all of it. Uh, and also taking into consideration certain tells that were there that certainly indicated latter editing and, uh, and tampering of the text. I was now, right, um, and, and I wasn't before, as I said, <laughs> a, a Tanakh fundamentalist. Now I was ready to really get into this with Ross. So this would have been 2018. Yeah, 2018. Because at the same time, I mean, we discussed, um, you know, all sorts of theories and hypotheses and, and, as I said, tells in the text. We discussed the first person priority in, in Deuteronomy. It was, we were starting to form a picture and it was starting to make more sense, right? And uh, we, we kind of had a, a feeling of what would have been included and what might have been excluded in the original scroll. At the same time, at this particular, uh, around the same time, uh, James 
G'day, James. I know you're watching. So James uh, Tabor, he shared a flight with, as, as Dave mentions, shared a flight with Shimon Gibson. And uh, they got into a discussion and conversation and they must have uh, touched on these topics. And Shimon Gibson said to James, you know, you ought to reconsider the um, Shapira scroll. And James had heard of it before, you know, like in seminary, and it was like, um, here's an example of a forgery, let's move on. No one really paid that much attention to it. Uh, Shimon suggested to James that he should. So uh, after a while, you know, James did give it some extra consideration and then he mentioned it to Ross, Ross mentioned it to me. We all got into looking at it and uh, <laughs> we examined it, we scrutinised it, we read the reports, the transcriptions of the document and we were immediately struck by the seamless narrative that seemed to bear striking similarities to that which we had hypothesised. Uh, so we were excited. We wanted to take a closer look. This being the case, I became increasingly interested in taking philosophical and theological challenges that are commonly levelled against the Torah, the, the Pentateuch, let me say, and seeing if they still apply to the Moses scroll. If you throw them at the Moses scroll, will they still stick? Right? Are there still the same sort of problems with this document as we have been experiencing with the Torah? Certain contradictions, certain challenges, scholarly criticism, discrepancies and so forth. So following are just a few of the things that I found really cool. Some of the things that really blew my mind in the process of doing this. As I mentioned earlier, it seemed fair that Ezra would have read at least the Ten Commandments, the blessings and the curses, right? As first priority components. Some of the first things that Ross and I, well, Ross actually brought this to my attention. <laughs> I still remember when he rang, he goes, man, you've got to look this up, you've got to look at this now. I mean, both of us just had this conversation going back and forth over, particularly over the first year of, have you seen this? Have you, have you noticed this? Um, so Ross brought to my attention the fact that the Pentateuch only has nine commandments. And it does, it has nine commandments. We call it the Ten Commandments because in three places in the, in the Tark, it makes reference to Ten Commandments. In order to make it ten, the, um, let's see, the, the Catholic and Lutheran counting method of the Ten Commandments counts the first commandment correctly, whereas Judaism and, and Protestant Christianity split no other gods and idolatry, no, no idolatry, into commandments one and two respectively. In turn, the Catholic and Lutheran uh, tradition divides the ninth commandment you shall not covered into two commandments in order to arrive at ten commandments. Having correctly conflated no other gods uh, with no idolatry at, uh, as the first. This division occurs between woman and property. You, know, you shall not covet your neighbour's woman. You shall not covet your neighbour's property. Judaism and, and uh, Protestant Christianity count those together as one. That's right. So in other words, some traditions split the first one into two, other traditions split the last one into two, but you have to arrive at ten. This is where we're at. The Moses scroll highlights the fact that both Exodus and Deuteronomy look, consist of only nine commandments. The tenth commandment in the Moses scroll, as Patty pointed out, uh, is you shall not hate your brother in your heart. I am Elohim, your Elohim, it says. It's not a new commandment. As Patty said, it's represented in Levit Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, uh, Leviticus 19, which is also clearly, in my mind, an attempt to recall the Ten Commandments as they appear in the Moses scroll. Um, there are other parallels as well. In Leviticus 19, there is a clear separation of commandments with the conclusion of each commandment saying, I, Jehovah, am your God. In the Moses scroll, the Moses scroll delineates each commandment with, I am Elohim, your Elohim, right? Um, it seems fairly straightforward to me. By the way, hate in your heart, right? This uh, particular commandment, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. Who would know what's in your heart but Elohim, right? Who would know? And to me, this, uh, this points out that the Commandment can only be judged by God, bringing to mind Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10. 
I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind to give to each person according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. This then highlights the nature of the blessings and the curses as divinely governed according to an individual's obedience or disobedience to the ten words and no more. Now, speaking of blessings, and this is another thing that Ross brought to my attention and it really just did my head in, the blessings are missing from Deuteronomy. You, you wouldn't know it unless you read the Moses scroll. They're just not there. Now, a lot of people will go to Deuteronomy and they say, no, look, that says, you know, blessed you when you go in and when you go out, but the blessed bees are not there. You have the cursed bees, cursed be the one and da-da-da-da-da, and all the people shall say amen, but you don't have the corresponding blessed bees. And this is actually acknowledged in um, uh, the English explanation of the Mishnah Sota 7.5. It puts it this way. It says, Deuteronomy 27 lists only the curses, and it also seems to assume that the Levites who stand in the middle pronounce the curses and the blessings. The Mishnah resolves these two difficulties by saying that the curses in Deuteronomy chapter 27 are only half of what is said. Not only were the curses recited, but the opposite of each curse was also recited as a blessing. We don't have that in Deuteronomy. It's assumed that they were there, uh, but it's missing. It becomes blatantly obvious when you read the Moses scroll. The Moses scroll, as many of you know, has the commandment. Each commandment has a corresponding blessing. Each blessing has, each commandment has a corresponding uh, curse. It's really seamless. It's, an, it's just an amazing document. Now, speaking of, um, well, I'll tell you what, let's jump off that into something different. This is something that uh, is often used by atheists against people of faith um, in, in monotheistic religion. This is called the Euthyphro Dilemma. I wanted to take this and, like I say, throw it at the Moses scroll and see if it sticks. The Euthyphro Dilemma is found in Plato's dialogue, Euthyphro, in which Socrates and Euthyphro are outside the courthouse discussing, having a conversation. Um, the, pi the, the nature of piety, actually, is what they're discussing. And uh, as they await unrelated uh, hearings, participation in unrelated hearings, it turns out that Euth Euthyphro is there, right, to testify against his father in a case that involves the death of a servant, right? The unjust death of a servant. And Euthyphro is there to testify against his father, saying he's responsible for that. And if that is successful, then Euthyphro's father is um, likely to have the, the death penalty passed, passed against him. And Socrates is like, why would, why would you do that? Why? This is your father we're talking about. What are you doing? And Euthyphro says, well, it's the pious thing to do. And so Socrates goes, okay, so how do you know that this is the pious thing to do? And he says, because the gods decree such. The gods love piety. And Euthyphro says, uh, well, Socrates then asks Euthyphro, is, and you've got to listen to this, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious? Or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? Now, the original context of, um, of this particular dilemma is set you know, in the, in the context of ancient Greek pantheon in uh, quite some time ago. But in 1702, Gottfried Leibniz, a, a German polymath whose disciplines included mathematics and philosophy and theology and ethics and philology, he rephrased the Euthyphro dilemma within the context of the biblical faith, uh, essentially asking, and this is what you want to dwell on here, whether God's commandments are good because God commands them, or does God command them because they are good? Have a think about it in your mind just for a minute. So are God's commandments, are they good because God commands them? Or does God command them because they are good? It's a dilemma because either answer is an uncomfortable position to defend. It's often used, as I said, by atheists to challenge people of faith. This is because if God gives commands because the commands are good, then moral goodness becomes external to God. In fact, good, moral goodness, becomes a tool that God uses and as such, objective morality supplants God as the ultimate goal. 
In other words, God is merely the conduit of morality and now that we have it, we have no further need of God. If, on the other hand, the commandments are good because God commands them, then good, right, is simply anything that God commands and thus morality becomes arbitrary. It ceases to have meaning. So either the divine, the divine commander, the creator, is bound by a standard outside himself or his goodness isn't actually a standard at all. It's just anything that he commands. Now, this dilemma is rightly applied to the Tanakh because the Bible includes several verses that specifically anchor morality to the divine command. For example, Exodus 15, 26. Now, there's a lot in Deuteronomy, actually. There's Deuteronomy 4, 8, 6, 17 to, to 18, 12, 25 and 28, chapter 13, verse 18. It appears strongly in uh, Psalm 119. Psalm 19 as well. Actually, there's a lot in 119. One, two, three, four, five, six uh, verses that uh, anchor morality to the commands. First Kings 11:38. 38. Second Kings 12, 2. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 13. I'll read that one. This is interesting because just remember a, a chapter ago, Ezra read the scroll of the Torah of Moses. And then, uh, and it says, Then you came down on Mount Sinai and you spoke to them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances, true laws, good statutes, and commandments. By the way, none of those verses that, uh, that I mentioned in Deuteronomy are representations of that which is in the Moses scroll. In fact, the Moses scroll never anchors the commandment to morality and thus sidesteps the dilemma entirely. I find this really interesting. It just isn't a problem. Rather than its moral evaluation, the divine command expects obedience on the strength of the public observation of power and the supremacy of and the, and the blessing from the divine commander. For example, in the Moses scroll, when Israel refuses to go up and take the hill country of the Amorites, right at the beginning, Elohim is angered and says, Surely as I live, surely you're the people who have seen my signs and my wonders that I have done these ten times. Since they have not listened to my voice, they will not see the good land. Good as in, we're not talking about a moral land, we're talking about a quality land. They will not see the good land. And God summarises in, uh, and by the way, you mentioned um, uh, Exodus chapter 19. My favourite verse uh, up until very recently was Exodus chapter 19 verse 9. Uh, that, that says, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, God is speaking to Moses and he says, I'm going to come and speak to the people aloud. I'm coming to freak them out so that they will believe in you forever. It says in uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 9. This is my new um, favourite verse, and this is Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23. You'd think it'd be something from the Moses scroll, but actually this is God uh, through the prophet Jeremiah giving a, if you like, a summary of the Moses scroll. I think it's just absolutely perfect. This command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. And then in the Moses scroll, it says, all the people of the earth will see it and they will be in awe of you. And that's the way it's supposed to work. Now, speaking of signs and wonders... As I just mentioned, God gets uh, angry and he makes reference to his signs and his wonders, which he did these ten times. This is in the Moses scroll. This narrative is represented in Numbers chapter 14, verses 21 to 22, with some variation. Numbers refers to my presence and my signs, not my signs and my wonders. Numbers refers to these ten times in relation to the number of rebellious acts of the people trying God rather than the number of signs and wonders. It's kind of different. Reading this passage in Numbers, one would understandably uh, be prompted to ask, what ten times did the people try a God? Has there ever, anyone ever done that exercise when you read this passage and you think, <coughs> can I trace those back? Can I find ten of those? Uh, and it would be fair to do so. Have, were you successful when you did that? Could you find ten? 
You, you think you found 14? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That they tried, God? They tried at the time when it was written. Yeah. Mm. So but you had to, you had to, when you read that, you're prompted to go and look for it, right? Yes. Right. So you would think that, um, you know, when reading the Moses scroll where it says, all the people who have seen my signs and my wonders, that I did these ten times, the inevitable question would arise, what signs and wonders? What ten times? And if I was to say that, if you were to ponder and think about the, uh, the five books, what signs and wonders, what ten times, what would you point me to? Who said? The plagues. The plagues. Yeah. It's obvious, right? It's absolutely obvious. So what happens is that there's a, a vacuum that is created here because the Moses scroll doesn't actually give you an answer. The Moses scroll just leaves it there because it's not so concerned about supplying information for further generations. It's talking to a people who knew these things. It's assuming knowledge. It's talking to a people who knew it. My signs and my wonders that I showed you these ten times. But where there's a vacuum, someone always wants to fill it. And it is the inevitable question, and we've all done it. Like, with, with numbers, you read that and you go, let me see if I can go back and I can find these. In the same way, if this is the original document that we're talking about here, that question's going to come up and someone's going to come and answer it. In this case, uh, P, the priestly writers, go, I, yeah, we've got an answer to that, all right? Let's go and start a narrative here, Exodus chapter 7, uh, all the way to Exodus chapter 12. These are the ten signs and wonders. Now, the reason why I can be fairly conclusive about that is because my signs and my wonders only appears in one place in the Tanakh. That phrase, I mean, and I mean that exact phrase in Hebrew, of course, my signs and my wonders, is found in Exodus chapter 7, verse 3, right at the very beginning of this narrative in the first person of God. Nowhere else in the Tanakh. It just screams to me that this is answering that inevitable question that arises from reading the Moses scroll. You won't get this from Numbers because Numbers doesn't say my signs and my wonders that I did these ten times. It says my presence and my signs and then it says you have tried me these ten times. It's a different thing. This is only a question that is answered and prompted by the Moses scroll. Now speaking of plagues... Moses recounts in, in the Moses scroll, and the daughters of Moab went forth at that time and the women of Midian to meet you and they called you to eat from their sacrifices and you ate from their sacrifices and you drank of their libations and you bowed to their God and you whored with the Midianite women and you were joined to Baal Peor in that day. And the anger of Elohim burned against you and he plagued a great plague against you at that time. Right? Now, that's the Moses scroll. Now, Joshua 22, verse 17, makes reference to the sin of Peor for which there came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord. That's in Joshua. That's after the fact, all right? But it's there. Deuteronomy 4, verse 3, states, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God destroyed from among you the men who followed Baal Peor doesn't make a mention of a plague, but it alludes to it, right? Numbers 25, which actually represents this narrative from the Moses scroll, with considerable variation, tells us that the plague against the Israelites was checked. It doesn't tell us that it started. If you were reading Numbers chapter 25 and you read that, you'd be like, what plague? Where? It doesn't, what plague? The plague was checked? This is the first I've heard of a plague because it doesn't tell you that a plague started. The only way that you know that a plague started is because in the Moses scroll, and again, it's assuming knowledge of the, of the reader. They know because uh, the Moses scroll says, Elohim plagued a great plague against you at that time. Only the Moses scroll tells you that there was a plague, that a plague had begun. Incidentally, Numbers 25 claims that God commanded Israel, Israelites to kill their brothers. As with the story of the Levites being instructed to do the same in the narrative of the golden calf, these purported divine commands fly in the face of the commandment given at Horeb. It appear, as it appears in the Moses scroll, it says, you shall not kill 
the soul of your brother. By the way, all the qualifiers of the commandments are missing in our canonical versions. Uh, the soul of your brother, the property of your neighbour, the, the, um, the woman of your, of your, and so on and so forth, all the qualifiers are gone. You shall not kill the soul of your brother. I am Elohim, your Elohim. So needless to say that you know, neither of these instructions were derived from the Moses scroll. Interestingly, uh, both of these narratives bolster the status of the priestly caste. There's more on that that could be said. Actually, Ross has done an excellent um, presentation on, on his Saturday morning um, talks about six, five weeks ago, maybe, uh, that, that addresses this in detail. Other things that blow my mind. Physical anthropomorphisms. It says in the Moses scroll, there shall be to you no other Elohim. Both Exodus and Deuteronomy add before my face, Alpine, right? Uh, physical anthropomorphisms, it attempts to describe God with um, imagery that we, that we understand with our own physicality, you know, before my face, you know, mighty arm, and outst uh, mighty hand and outstretched arm, that sort of stuff. Um, before my face, th this phrase is used eight times in Deuteronomy, but only once is it derived from the Moses scroll, and that's uh, Deuteronomy 11.25, and it's in reference to the face of the land, it's not in reference to God. All 13 physical anthropomorphic references used to describe God found in Deuteronomy are missing entirely, entirely absent from, from the Moses scroll, uh, scroll. It just doesn't exist. What else is missing? Well, here's a glaring one. <laughs> well, that's time for questions. Um, giants. I know I'm big, but I'm not that big. Giants. Pretty big. I'm pretty big. <laughs> In the Pentateuch, the Nephilim, right? We all know it's a great story. Everyone wants to know exactly what the Nephilim was. Uh, chapter 6, verse 4, is equated with the Anakim. The Anakim, in, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, uh, they are equated with the Rephaim, the Rephaim with the Yamim. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. That's then equated with the Zamzumim, Deuteronomy 2, verse 21. By the way, Zamzumim in the, in the Moses scroll has an ayin at the front of it, a Zamzumim, if that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. I once speculated that perhaps it meant goats plotting. Has anyone ever owned goats? No? Well, let me tell you, they're mischievous. You know, I went home when I, when I saw this and I, I said to my wife, how would you describe goats? And she said, mischievous. And I said, well, I think this is how they're um, describing these people, the Zamzumim. Uh, it's possible, but then my uh, my friend at the library where I study, uh, who's a, a brilliant uh, Hebrew teacher, and I put it in front of me, said that those words are there, but goats is in the plural, plotting's in the singular, that's not going to work for you. But actually, in Ross's book, which is coming out in a week or, or so, um, Guter writes about this, and he's, he's got a, a fairly detailed answer to what this could possibly mean. Um, <laughs> Again, if you were a forger, why would you add a letter to a random word, right? It's kind of weird. Anyhow, uh, the Zamzumim. Genesis claims that, Yeho uh, that Jehovah flooded the earth in order that he might wipe, the face of, uh, wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created. That's uh, Genesis 6-7, with the exception of Noah and his family, as you know, right? Um, it's highly problematic for the Pentateuch because... Uh, but not for the Moses scroll, but um, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28, is the uh, first of six mentions of the Anakites, which, as I mentioned, are equated with the Nephilim. They are described as giants within Deuteronomy. Uh, never are they mentioned, not once, in the Moses scroll. Completely devoid, uh, the Anakites, of archaeological evidence, these giants are clearly a mythical addition and think about it, I mean, a race of giants, wouldn't their stuff just be bigger and easier to find, right? Let alone their, their, their skeletons, but their stuff, <laughs> their bowls, their pottery, their all this sort of stuff. We have absolutely no archaeological evidence for that. The Moses scroll doesn't mention it once. So perhaps it's not the content of the Moses scroll that is the most controversial thing 
but rather that which is additional in the Pentateuch. How much of the Tanakh can we rely on as divinely imparted or material compatible with the Moses scroll? Is there any concurrence with narratives from Genesis, for example, in the Moses scroll? I mean, these, this is the questions that you start to ask yourself when you go down this path. And if this is the original, how much of this can I rely on? Is there anything that concurs with the Moses scroll? So in Genesis, for example, pre-Exodus, uh, the answer is actually yes. You'd be pleased to know. The division of the tribes on Mount Ebal and Gerizim in the Moses scroll creates a multi-layered pattern concurring with the genealogy of Genesis chapter 46. This pattern is interrupted in Deuteronomy, by the way. Deuteronomy's division of tribes uses uh, Joseph instead of Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, and it throws the number out. How are you going to divide it and have the Levites in the middle? You're going to have five on one, six on the other, Levites in the middle. It's not, it's not right. The Moses scroll uses Manasseh and Ephraim, and you have six either side with the Levites in the middle. Deuteronomy 27 verse 12, fails, as I mentioned, fails to mention Manasseh and Ephraim as tribes and lists Joseph instead. In doing so, only five tribes are standing on Mount Gerizim. Deuteronomy places Levi on the mount with them to put... You've got no one in the middle now. He takes the Levites and puts them on the mount because you've got Joseph and you don't have Manasseh and Ephraim. You need six, so they put Levi there and then they don't... Maybe this is a reason why we don't have the, uh, the blessings in Deuteronomy. There's no one to call them out. Um, on the mount with, yeah, okay, so the, uh, the Moses scroll in Joshua chapter 8 verse 50, uh, 33, rather, positions the Levites in the middle. Take a moment and consider how you might divide them because <laughs> you know eventually how brothers fight, perhaps, and you don't want to show favoritism in any way. You don't want there to be any discussions developing over time about how where the we were on the Mount of Blessings and you guys are on the Mount of, or, or, or whatever it might be. How would you divide them? What would be a fair way to divide them? It's worth considering. Only the Moses scroll has a curious pattern that appears in the ordered listing of the tribes. When cross-referenced with the, the genealogy of uh, Jacob in Genesis, it reveals the following. On Mount Ebal, here's the pattern, you ready? You have oldest, youngest, oldest, youngest, oldest, youngest, right? And it's not just that. You have Leah, Leah, Zilpa, Zilpa, Bilha, Bilha, in that order. And then you've got the oldest, youngest, oldest, youngest, oldest, youngest. So you can't say, well, we're all the, the, the eldest, you know, the, the majority of the eldest are over, you know, whatever. Uh, it's balanced by the youngest being there as well. On the other side, now remember you've got um, Levi in the middle. On the other side you have, there you go, <laughs> Leah's middle sons in order uh, and you have Rachel's sons in order. And remember we're talking about Manasseh, Ephraim, Benjamin. So in, again, Deuteronomy it appears differently. On Gerizim you have Leah's, uh, Leah's uh, sons including Levi uh, and Rachel's son is Joseph on Mount Ebal it, the, the pattern goes oldest, oldest, youngest youngest, oldest, youngest it, it doesn't really the, that pattern is interrupted am I clear? Are people understanding what I'm saying? because I, I know it's a little bit hard to visualise so I'll say it one more time on Mount Ebal Leah, Leah, Zilpa, Zilpa, Bilha, Bilha that is the eldest, youngest, eldest, youngest, eldest, youngest. On Mount Gerizim, you have Leah's middle children in order of birth. You have, of course, Levi in the middle, in the valley. And joining them is Rachel's three sons. You have Manasseh, Ephraim, and Benjamin. Now, by the way, uh, we're told in the, in the narrative of uh, Joseph that Manasseh is the firstborn of Joseph and then... Now, interestingly, there's the whole crossing of the hands when the blessing is given by Jacob, right? Uh, Ephraim is, is um, we're to understand, is given the uh, firstborn blessing. 
the Moses scroll knows nothing of Joseph. It doesn't mention Joseph. It doesn't mention Joseph. Joseph. Yeah, there is no Joseph in the Moses scroll. Now, that's not to say there is no Joseph. But it is this, it, it, it is, you know, it's a possibility that there is no Joseph. I know this is highly controversial is what I'm telling you, but you could actually extract that whole narrative out and it won't make any difference to this whatsoever. All right? How many sons does, are there? Uh, well, it, tribes? If, well, there's 13 tribes. Okay. You've got six either side and one in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Remember Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Benjamin. So three. He never had a Joseph son. Is that what you're saying? He never had a son named Joseph in the. In the Moses scroll, it's not mentioned. It doesn't. It's not mentioned in the um, dividing up of the tribes. It is in Deuteronomy, but that messes up the equilibrium, if you like. It messes up the balance of tribes either side. In Deuteronomy, it places Levi with Joseph, so that there's six aside. Okay. So there's that. But in any case, it does confirm, it, it, it seems to concern, concern, confirm, at least because that multi-layered pattern is in the division of the tribes upon Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, it seems to me that that does confirm the genealogy of, of uh, Genesis chapter 46, 48. It's in there. What about going forward? What about prophecy? Is there anything in prophecy that might point back to the Moses scroll? Is there anything in prophecy that we can recognise as being specifically about the Moses scroll? So I think this will blow, really blow your mind because it really blew mine. I was lying in bed, um, you know, one night, and this happened a lot actually when I was studying through the Moses scroll, particularly early on, and I'd have to get up and get out of bed and go and open a Bible somewhere and get back into it because... <laughs> Things just pop into your head and you're like, oh, my goodness, what is that? And I remembered a verse, and I couldn't remember exactly where it was. Had to get out of bed to go find it. Micah chapter 4. And it will come about, this is from verse 1, it will come about in the last days. Just make a note, in the last days. Mm -hmm. That the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of mountains... It will be raised above the hills and the people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob so that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Because from Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, let me just emphasize that it's, it's talking about the last days. It's not talking about, you know, at some stage back then, okay, we are where we are right now in this point of history. The word of the Lord will go out from Jerusalem and, go, and, and from uh, Zion will go forth the Torah. And I thought to myself, surely, surely if we are correct about this document, if this document is actually an accurate copy, a genuine copy, an authentic copy of the scroll of the Torah of Moses, then I should be able to look at this and decipher... It must be referring to that, if, I'm, if we're right, okay? So we read on, and we go to verse 6. On that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble those who are limp and gather the scattered, those who I'm, whom I have, have afflicted, I will make those who limp a remnant and, I, and, and those who have strayed a mighty nation, and the Lord will reign over them on Zion from now on and forever. Did we see anything like that happen? Would it be fair to say that the nation of Israel is an unprecedented moment in history? That the alia of Israel, the return of, of Israel to the land, is an unprecedented moment in history? That the scale of alia is just phenomenal. Millions of Jews in our time are returning to the land, and in 48, it became a nation once again. When did it start? When did that, when did that wave begin? Hmm? Well, 40, well, now, 48, it became a nation. That's fair. But when did that wave begin and, and lead up to that moment? Will it blow your mind if I tell you it was 19, 18, 1878? 1878. 
The first Aliyah of the 1800s was the first major wave of Jewish immigration to the Holy Land. Jews who migrated in this wave came mostly from Eastern Europe and, uh, and Yemen. Petatikva. Has anyone been to Petatikva? Like, we've driven through it, right? I don't know that we're going to have to stop there now. But uh, let, me, let me tell you this story. Petatikva means door of hope or um, door of opening, uh, an opening of hope. It's a phrase derived from the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 14 to 15, or 16 to 17 in the Hebrew. It says, Therefore, behold, I, God, am going to persuade her, Israel, bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there and, I, and, and the valley of Accor as a door of hope. This is where Petitikva comes from. And she will respond there as in the days of her youth as in the day when she went up from the land of Egypt, right? In this passage, God likens himself as a husband who brings back his wife, Israel, who responds faithfully as in the days of her youth, and her husband, God, will provide her via the fertility of the land and so forth. Are we seeing that? I think we're seeing that. Petitikva was therefore a fitting name, right, for a community founded in 1878 by Jewish pioneers from Europe. It was the first modern Jewish agricultural community in what would eventually come, become known uh, in the land, the nation of Israel, as you pointed out, 70 years later, exactly 70 years later. Hence, uh, Petr Tikva's nickname, the mother of the Moshevot, Em HaMoshevot. Uh, by the way, Rosh Pinar was another one of those uh, very early uh, communities established under the name of uh, Geoni uh, in 1878. Both of those started in 1878 uh, by local Jews from uh, Sfat. We go there on the tour. But it was abandoned. In 1882, 30 Jewish families who had immigrated from Romania re-established that particular settlement as Moshav and named it Rosh Pina. Uh, the town is one of the oldest Zionist settlements in Israel. Now, in 1878, the founders of Petr Tikva learned of the avail uh, availability of the land uh, northeast of Jaffa. The land was owned by two Christian businessmen from uh, Jaffa. They initially purchased the land for this pioneering settlement uh, on July the 30th, 1878. Now, I only came across that particular date fairly recently when I was researching for this talk. July 30th, 1878, they purchased the first piece of land to establish Petr Tikva in 1878, July 30. So I went to, to, <laughs> I went to Ross's book and I thought, here's a date. I wonder if Ross mentions any dates that would really sort of, uh, that, that I could align with. So I opened up the book. Have you got a book there? I do. You have just, a page number? Yeah, well, no, just open the, the, the first chapter. Oh. And the first uh, words that you open with the entire book. Honestly, I didn't know this. All right. I know this. You know it. In July of 1878. In July of 1878. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you've got to be kidding. What happened in July 1878? This is the, the Arabs approaching, the Bedouin approaching Moses Shapiro saying, hey, we've heard that you deal in this stuff. Is this worth any money to you? Because we're, we like money. And we've got some stuff that we think you'd be interested. You seem to be the guy. This seems to be an old Hebrew. We've got 16 leather strips. And we thought we'd sell it to a Jewish person. And you're the guy. Is this of interest to you? Yeah. And as, as Dave pointed out, by the end of uh, August 1878, he had acquired all of those strips. It just happened to coincide with the beginning, with, when, the, when the first land was being purchased in Israel, by Jews of the diaspora coming back into the land, setting off the first wave of Aliyah. It's just a coincidence, right? So, <laughs> believe me, it blew my mind. All right. Now, in 78, it doesn't stop there. 78, Shapira had acquired the entire 16 leather strips on the 24th of September, 1878. After nearly a month of work, Right? Shapira's transcribing, he's trying to understand, he's straining his eyes, he says, this thing is so hard to read, it's doing my head in. But he produces a transcription, 
and he sends it to Shlotman, right? He sends Shlotman the, the transcription of the Moses scroll, and on the 7th of October, Shapiro received a stern reply from Shlotman, who immediately declared the transcription to be a forgery. Why, Ross? Why? It disagrees with our Bible. It disagrees with our Bible. It can't be true. Don't be silly. I'm not willing to entertain this. It disagrees with our Bible. How many times, for those of you who may have refined your faith from, uh, from the New Testament to the Tanakh, have you immediately encountered that one? No, 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 it disagrees with our theology. It can't be. No, I'm not interested in even entertaining it. He shoots it down immediately. And at this, you know, Shapiro <laughs> thought it best to safely store the document in a vault, a bank vault in Jerusalem. So he does that. It's a step back. Now, now mind you, this is the, I, I rang Ross after finding this, um, uh, reacquainting myself with Micah chapter four, and I said, dude, seriously, when was the first time the Moses scroll went out from Jerusalem into the world? And he said, well, that was in 1883. I said, no, no, no. Did it go out before then? He said, no, well, he took the scroll in 1883. He went to uh, uh, Leipzig, he went to London, I said, yeah, but was there a copy sent? Before? Oh, he, yeah, of course there was a copy. He did his own transcription and he sent it. I said, when was that? He goes, that was in 1878. And I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> are you serious? It just blows my mind. Now it's stored in a bank vault. It's not going anywhere. It seems to be put to rest once again. Meanwhile, back in Petatikva, right, it wasn't, it wasn't long before a malaria outbreak, uh, a malaria epidemic, it broke out, and like Rosh Pina, the community was abandoned and those who remained in the area moved further south to Yehud. Later on, back with Shapira, perhaps in uh, the latter months of 1882 maybe, Shapira reads a book by Friedrich Bleek. Uh, it's entitled Introduction to the Old Testament. Bleek's book overwrote Schlotman's objections. Shapira was now convinced that what he had was an authentic Eloist document. What Bleak was writing about was, you know, something along the lines of the, the documentary hypothesis. Different writers contributing to the Pentateuch for what we have now. Shapiro realises, I've got an Elvis document. This has got to be a genuine thing. What does he do? He goes and he gets his, his document out of the, I mean, he's in, entirely motivated now by his new, newfound knowledge. He takes it uh, out of the bank vault in Jerusalem, where it had resided for the last five years, and takes it to the world. Meanwhile, in Petatikva, Petatikva was reoccupied by Bilu immigrants in 1883. He takes it out in 1883. He takes it to the world. Bilu immigrants, right, come from <coughs> Europe and re-establish Petatikva in that same year. Bilu was a Jewish movement whose primary goal was the agricultural settlement of the land of Israel. Bilu is an acronym, open your Bible, based on a verse from Isaiah 2.5. English works. English works. Now, the acronym comes from Beit Yaakov, Lechu, Venelka, right? Um, House of Jacob, let us go up. What does it say there? Uh, Isaiah chapter Isaiah 2, verse 5. 5. O House of Jacob, come let us walk by the light of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, don't close it. I just want you to go back a couple of verses and tell me what it says. What does it say? <laughs> Check out a couple of verses before that in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mount of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For instruction shall come forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Does that blow your mind? Are you feeling that? I mean, it just blows my mind. Clearly all orchestrated by a forger, obviously, but... <laughs> Some of the original families returned to Petatikva once the Belu uh, re-established it. And with funding for, for swamp drainage provided by uh, Baron Edmund de Rothschild, the community was never again abandoned and continues to go from strength to strength to this very day. Likewise, I believe and we're still talking about it now, the Moses scroll, the scroll of the Torah of Moses. 
continues to go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, never again to be obscure, obscured from memory. So that concludes my session. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions if there are any. I'm sure there probably are. <laughs>